Today, I'm showing you how to make full songs on the Roland MC-707, including setting your song up to turn it into a full song, setting up scenes, scene chaining, aka the closest thing we have to a song mode on the 707, live performance, and a bit of post-processing. This process really plays into the strengths of the 707, letting you get a hands-on dynamic performance that's fun to execute and makes for a decent video to boot, but also lets you get the polish of like a proper song that would go on an album, for instance. And to demonstrate all this, I'm going to be using one of my favorite things I've ever made on the 707. So all that being said, let's jump into it. First off, let me just show you the layers I'm working with. I'm just going to build them up rapid fire here. So the first thing that I want to point your attention to, and this is more of like a big picture song construction thing, is what I like to call the minimum viable song section. So within these eight tracks, you'll notice I very deliberately filled them all. I've got multiple little subsections that I can form by muting and unmuting stuff. For instance, for the intro of the track, I'm just using the ARP. Let me bring the filter down. I can bring in the pad. And then for some harmonic interest, I can slowly bring in that little ARP layer. So the ARP works by itself as an intro element. It works with the pad by itself as a kind of breakdown thing. It works with the second ARP as a way to like build interest. And then all this stuff together. Plus the second pad. works as another song of section. Then I know I can break this down, maybe tame the ARP a bit, bring in your melody. Bring in my second melody layer, which by the way sounds like this, which is a sample that I've loaded into here and then sent to this panning LFO, which is super fun. I've got all these different sections that I can work with, and yet once everything is brought in, it all works together pretty well. And that's the beauty of having this many tracks. I've also got a second section. with the same bass line, so I can start launching those clips and then I can launch the scene, which kind of like earns me another repetition of this main section. And then I can break it back down similarly to how I built it up. Let's quickly talk about scenes. This is the perfect segue to that. By default, this is how to work with scenes and it's pretty damn simple. First of all, select the combination of patterns that you want. So in this case, let's do this. All you gotta do is hold this down. Notice up here, it said store scene. And now let me just switch to a different scene to recall that scene, boop, that's all I have to do. And it launches just like a normal clip. That's literally it. So if you've got a bunch of patterns ready to go, categorizing them into scenes, which like a, all a scene is in this case, is just like a combination of patterns that are selected and that are on or off. And so once you've got a bunch of patterns, building up scenes is super easy because they're just like holding tanks for combinations of patterns that you can then launch.
and you can still like recombine launching clips. So this brings me to a problem with the way that this thing handles monophonic patches. You may have noticed that when this section kicked in, everything clashed really badly. That is because for some reason it ignores monophonic patches being monophonic between uh, pattern switches. So listen to this. This is the scene that we just created. And it let them overlap. Now, what I ended up doing is going in post and just grabbing one instance of that 808 loop, like the first instance that played, and just chopping that out and looping it over the course of the song, wherever it appeared. It's a bit of extra work, but pretty easy to do. I shouldn't have to do that, but I did kind of feel the need to do that. If you know of a workaround for this, please let me know and I will pin a comment below. Regardless, the other nice thing about scenes is that because these are just combinations of patterns that it pulls up, it's really easy to like basically copy a scene and recombine stuff because like, let's say I want another scene with like one of these clips active. Well, I can just now save it here or hold down shift and hold down one of these to get to scenes five, six, seven, and eight like this. And we just stored scene five. All these are turned down, so that's not really going to get the idea across. And that's clashing because that was not really meant to be that. But you'll notice it even changes colors. So in this mode, doing live performance becomes very easy once you've got enough tracks ready to go to build up a song arrangement. It does take some kind of thinking through it. So what I would advise doing is basically once you've got enough patterns, just sit down and start to like perform a full arrangement. And if you get stuck, like you realize, oh wait, I wanted to do this filter sweep and all these changes at the same time. That's probably your cue to go in and create a scene, maybe a few scenes, depending on what song changes you want to add. And be aware of the whole uh, note overlap thing that I ran into. And from there, of course, the beauty of this is that we've got access to do our filter sweeps like on the unit itself. We've got our master effects if you want to do kind of like big picture changes like a low cut filter sweeping in right before a drop or a big section change or something like that. This is pretty well set up for that. So if you're really strategic with how you set up your scenes, theoretically, you could kind of have a song go through on autopilot, like have scenes be really in order, and then you'd have plenty of flexibility to do all the other stuff that you would do during a live performance, or maybe you're playing like a separate instrument. You've got that flexibility to either make your live performances pretty risky, like you're launching clips and doing all the stuff on the fly, or to be pretty like fail proof. I should also mention other tools you have at your disposal. Of course, you've got the faders for either bringing stuff in immediately, which is visually fun and it like feels fun to do, but it's not that like functional necessarily. And of course, like I alluded to earlier, you can use them to slowly bring in an element or rein an element in. But if you don't want to deal with these for muting and unmuting stuff, you do have your mute tab here. which almost functions like another level of patterns. So you can get as granular and as like flying by the seat of your pants as you want with this setup. But let's say that you want to be completely hands off other than maybe some like filter sweeps and such. That's where the scene chaining comes in. So for a bit of context, scene chaining is the closest thing you're going to get to a song mode on this thing, and it was added via a firmware update. So in typical Roland fashion, it is functional, but overly complicated to use. So I'm going to break this down for you as best I can. Also, if you use the timestamps to skip to this point, welcome. Uh, you now legally have to like the video. Hopefully this helps you out. Uh, first of all, go to shift and knob assign, which gets you to utility. You want to be in set, hit enter, and by default, you'll be put at the top of the menu under the control tab. Scroll most of the way down until you get to call scene. By default, it is set to type one. Change it to type two. This changes how scenes behave and how many you're allowed to have. So let's go ahead and exit out of that. Now you have banks of scenes. 
And each of these buttons controls which bank of scenes that you are in. And you are allowed to have 16 scenes per bank. So for the purposes of this, I'm going to just hop into bank two. And you will notice that all of these lit up a light blue. So now your scenes will be contained on your 16 step buttons. And here is the big key for using this as a song mode. They need to be in the order that you want them to play in for song mode to work. That's hugely important. So when you're building your scenes in preparation for having a song play all the way through, you want these to be in order. And you can have multiple banks. And so you could have multiple like separate arrangements if you wanted to. I don't really know why you'd want that, but that's there in case you do. So let me show you how to build these up. Go ahead and select your combination of patterns. So in this case, let's say I want to start off with just my art part and uh, my main melody. Why not? Let's just do that. Hold down the bank that you want to save it to, long press it, and then select your scene slot. So now this step pad contains that scene. And if I go to mute, I can see all my scenes laid out here and I can select them and I can still have access to my mutes and I can see what patterns are selected just at a quick glance. If I select this next scene, there's nothing in it because I haven't set it up yet. So I can go back to clip. I can select a combination of patterns. Let's do my 808. hold down the bank button and select the next numbered pad that I want to store the scene in. So now let's go back to mute. I can launch this scene. I can launch this scene and they'll behave pretty much the way that you would expect. Now, this looks like this would get pretty tedious if you had to select every single clip that you want every single time. But fortunately, you can still basically copy scenes over. For instance, this scene two right here. Let's say I wanted to kind of wind my track down. So near the end of this, I want to have a duplicate of this. While I have this active, all I have to do is hold down my bank and then select the step that I want that to go to. And it just saves that combination of clips to this step. So it lives here and it lives here. Or let's say I want to have this just add one more part for the next section of the song. Let me add my pad, hold down your bank button, and now so if you already have an arrangement in mind with your song, hopefully this can get pretty quick and easy to deal with. You can kind of just work your way linearly or get sections that you know you want and kind of dot them around. Now, here's how to chain them. Hit shift and hit a step, and you will be greeted with this window right here. By default, chain is turned off, so I'm just going to go ahead and turn it on. And also, by default, length is sent to off. What this means is that once it finishes playing this entire scene, it'll go to the next one. Once it finishes playing this entire scene, it'll go to the next one, so on and so forth down the line. But you have a bit more control than that because you can choose the length. So for instance, let me just set this to one so you can hear it happens. So it just played the first bar of this first scene and then jumped immediately to the next one. I could also do something like have it play twice if I set a length that is double the length of the scene. So right there, it repeated. And then it goes on to the next one. So controlling that length plus having these set up in advance is how you're going to build up a song. It's not super elegant. It's a little bit clunky, but once again, it's functional. So now that we've recorded our chain of scenes or live performance or some combination thereof into our DAW multitrack over USB, it's time to get into a little bit of post-processing. I have some specific things that I always go for that really go a long way to clean up the tracks while keeping the character of them intact, while also filling everything out and making it sound as full and as pretty as possible. So let's jump into Reaper. So just to jog your memory, here's what everything
So let's quickly go through this. The drums have a bit of light EQ and compression. Nothing too crazy there. This pad has one of my favorite reverb plugins spaced out. Without. With. And then some EQ to just get rid of all that muddy low end. This is one of the things I pretty much always do with multi-tracked hardware stuff. There's always this low end mud that I now have the opportunity to clean up on a track by track basis. So I'm damn well going to take advantage of it. Maybe it sounds a bit thin in isolation, but in the context of the full mix, it helps quite a bit. I have also used some EQ to clean up this 808. And even then, that still might be like a little much in the lower mids department. And I've got some parallel processing, mild distortion. Up next, I've got like a lot of stuff on this pluck. So let me get rid of everything, among other things. Just some very mild delay, a bit of reverb, a bit more delay, limiter to catch some peaks, because when the cutoff really opened, it got pretty damn loud. And with that, I have a volume adjustment plugin. That way I could automate the volume of this part, but still take the overall volume up and down with the volume fader because when I've opened up the cutoff a lot, it got very loud. And once again, because I'm doing this in post, I have the opportunity to correct that. So I could just open the cutoff with reckless abandon and not worry about how it was just completely taking over the track because I could fix that later, which I took full advantage of here. So the more the cutoff gets lifted, the more I turn it down and vice versa. Once again, this sounds fairly thin in comparison, but it works a lot better in the mix. We've got our uh, ARP layer with a bit of volume automation of its own and quite a bit of EQ. Pretty similar processing to the pad on our main uh, lead. Spaced out. Cutting lows and boosting highs. We're in the uh, shimmer adding phase here, and that is very much the case on this pad. It's nice, fairly static. So first of all, we clean it up a bit. And add this lovely octave up reversed delay from Crystallizer. Before. After. In my opinion, that really brings it to life. As long as you keep it subtle, it just fills out the mix nicely adds, once again, what I would refer to as a nice shimmer. Vocal sample. There's some clean up EQ. And then a duplicate of that track that I've parallel processed. Once again, for more shimmer, same EQ. I've pitched up an octave and then just drowned it in reverb. So here's the original without that parallel process track. Here's with. And that, I think, goes a long way towards bringing the track to life. And in this case, you'll notice I didn't do any side chain. I actually tried it and it just didn't sound right in this case. So I just didn't bother. Although that's another advantage of doing this method is that if your track calls for side chain, you can actually add it because the 707, unfortunately, does not have any capabilities for that built in. And while we're at it, let me show you my very basic mastering settings. I ended up doing quite a bit of referencing, especially to some kind of similar tracks. And I ended up uh, going for some ridiculous ridiculous EQ. Bit of compression, multi-band compression, and a fairly intense maximizer with some pretty heavy transient emphasis to still let those percussive elements punch through. The amount of stuff that I've done here looks kind of extreme for how few effects I actually have, but in this case, it got it much closer to the reference tracks. And those are my benchmarks, and I've referenced this on multiple different listening systems, and I'm pretty sure that I was able to nail down something that sounds pretty good. If you'd like to see and hear the full song performance that I used as an example in this video, you can check it out up over here. 
And if you'd like to see how to turn the MC-101, the 707's little cousin, into a more powerful device than its size suggests, kind of 707 level, you can check out this video up over here. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll be back with a new video in a little bit.